Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 456. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other great shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. So this week's interview is with Gare Maxwell. Gare's a brand strategist and renowned speaker. He's also author of the recently released Big Little Legends, How Everyday Leaders Build Irresistible Brands, published by my friends at Page Two. In this conversation with Gare, we discuss his new book, What Success Looks Like, the importance of storytelling, how to find your unique story, the importance of instinct and personal history, as well as many other fun topics. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. And please do consider to drop in your rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show with Gare. Gare Maxwell, I suppose uh, London Calling would be an appropriate uh, starting song for us. Uh, I'm based in London. You're based in London. You're an author, speaker, brand strategist, uh, living in London, Ontario. Gare, in your own words, how'd you like to describe yourself? Well, I'm the proud father of three. That would be two Cocker Spaniels and a Beagle Mix Rescue. How's that? Love it, uh, love it. Ju ju just for starters, I'm a three-time runner-up on the prestigious MGA Golf Tour, uh, mm -hmm. which we can talk about later. Um, and what else? I'm an accredited Tennessee squire uh, by order of um, the managing director of Jack Daniels Whiskey. Ooh. I mean, how many stories do you want to get into, Minter? Well, I, let, I, let, well I mean, like getting getting a Jack Daniels squire ship. I mean, that tell us how you got that. It came in the mail one day. It literally showed up, uh, you know, through FedEx or whatever. And what it is, in fact, I can even, uh, I think I've got the deed here I can pull out and show you maybe if it's right handy, but, oh, there it is. Um, there, there's the well, cover letter. Have send, from, you have to send me a photograph for, for our viewer, our listeners. Cause it's exactly. Only listeners. So it comes with a deed to an unrecorded plot of land on the site of the Jack Daniels distillery in Lynchburg, Tennessee. And I was floored, Minter, and it's it's in great uh, legalese and detail um, that, uh, you know, this grants, conveys, and confirms unto the said party of the second part the following titles and rights. It, I can bequeath this unrecorded plot of land to my heirs. And, and that's not a bad springboard into Big Little Legends because... That's something that really inspired. And this goes back, Minter, to uh, I think it was 2013 when that package arrived, something like that. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I had met one of the senior marketing executives with Jack Daniels at an event we were at in Texas. And this shows up on my door one day. And I, I was absolutely floored that Jack Daniels would take storytelling, the art of storytelling, which I know you love and appreciate and admire and respect. The, the fact that they would take it that far, I, I just thought it, it, it was absolutely, you know, um, cataclysmic in terms of the emotional impact I had and, 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 and of course, you can see what I did here, and maybe I can send you some photographs, but like I got these things laminated, right? These, be these become little treasures that you don't throw away. How much, how much marketing collateral gets thrown away all oh the time? Oh. Oh, but how many pieces do you keep right. and keep forever? And to the point where they also give you the, the little card that can go in your wallet. And, and so you're a card carrying Tennessee Squire. And so when I was uh, researching the book and it spent, I spent nearly four years researching and writing the book in terms of the process of how this was all going to be laid out. Um, that was one of the key inspirations for chapter eight, which is the power of symbols and rituals. And when you dig into the story of Jack Daniels, um, it's fascinating how they were able to come up with something so simplistically brilliant to 
really helped solidify their hardcore fans. And this goes back to the mid 1950s. So it's no accident that Jack Daniels in my, you know, is statistically like the American leading export of spirit. They're they're the winner in terms of America's number one export in terms of spirits. And that's what we've tried to do with big little legends mentor is, is really deconstruct some of the key elements that create market leaders without necessarily having to spend your way to the top. So I, I wanted to get started in, in the notion of success. Mm-hmm. Somehow I feel it's intimately related to the creation of long-term branding. So how would you describe for Gare Maxwell success? It's a great question. Um, and it's actually one, it's not the answer you probably typically hear on the, on this podcast. So I do, I, I love your question because to me, it, it all comes down to professional respect and, and, and working this craft. You, I look at you mentor and I can see with your body of work, you, you, you're invested in a, in a craft that's sometimes hard to define. So if I'm giving you the short snappy answer, I want to be regarded as one of the world's leading authorities on actually creating legendary brands. Mm -hmm. And Big Little Legends is the metaphor for the small to medium sized companies that have actually done this. So this isn't so much about, you know, Apple and Coca-Cola and Starbucks and Amazon and Disney and Nike. No, this is about taking the same principles and applying them, as you saw through the book, to those otherwise very ordinary small to medium-sized businesses so that they, could, too, can enjoy an incredible competitive advantage. Well, we're going to get to that, without a doubt. But following up on, on that notion in your book, you, you definitely call out how finance and education are not the measures of success and and and, uh, and you you much more look at things like emotional grit and creative metal. So when you are running a brand, how do you dissociate the return on investment from mm. sending out a unlaminated deed to a chap in Ontario? <laughs> how, how does one how does one actually allow for that kind of crazy thinking? you know, from the outside, right? to exist when you have a CFO who says, hey, Mr. Maxwell, what are you, why are you spending that money? Right, because the CFO is asking the wrong question. That's why. Deep down, mentor, return on investment is the wrong question to be asking in this discipline. Ask it all you want with mathematics. Ask it all you want with operational excellence. Wrong question in this discipline. I I, I just spoke with three different executive groups out of South Florida this week via Zoom, the magic of this technology. Mentor, it's when it gets right down to it, the actual language of brand is a different language all unto itself to fully understand its power, its horsepower, its capacity, whatever. It's metaphorical, meaningful, emotional, symbolic. That's what it is. That's how the greatest brands in the world exist because they speak a language of which is metaphorical, meaningful, emotional, symbolic. The language of business, as articulated by the aforementioned CFO, is logical, linear, analytical, mathematical, mechanical, factual, rational, two entirely different languages. Um, maybe to follow that, up on that. Yeah, that's Does great. that make sense, though? Yeah, of course it does. Yeah. Uh, and, and you even talk about branding as a verb. Um, when you referred to Karen Post's brand tattoos, right. uh, something I've written about a lot, and this notion of tattooing people uh, with that brand and, and the emotional attachment that, that comes with, I, I don't know if you have any tattoos, but you'd presumably be theoretically, if you like tattoos, 
willing to tattoo a portion of your skin with, with Jack Daniels. Exactly. In fact, I remember being in, um, where was it? It was Knoxville, Tennessee at, at the hotel bar. And, and the subject came up with this complete stranger. And what does he, what does he do mentor? He uh. rolls up the sleeve to show me his Jack Daniels tattoo. I've seen people roll up their sleeves to show me their Oakland Raiders tattoo. I've seen them show me their Apple tattoo. Guess what I can never find? No one's showing me their Acer tattoo. Mm -hmm. And that's not to knock Acer as a product or Reebok as a pro. I've never seen a Reebok tattoo, but I have seen a Nike. And the point is tattooing is is that deep emotional imprint when jack daniel's whiskey sent me my unrecorded plot of land and the deed uh to which i own that do you think maybe they implanted that forever of course they did what's my product of choice i won't buy anything else i will advocate what did we do right now on this show we advocated and espoused the merits of Jack Daniel's whiskey, which speaks to the power of word of mouth. It's still, no matter how much technology and, and no matter how much digital transformation and all and, and, and buzzwords and magic keywords, what's the most powerful form of advertising that ever known to man? It's still wow. warm word of mouth. And I think what's happened is the, you know, the how-to hounds and the data crazy analytics have really complicated something that's incredibly simple, which is you for a brand to be, which is why I love you brought up Karen Post. I thought her definition was so bang on because it would last for centuries. A brand is a story embedded in the mind of the market. People share stories. That's what they, that's what you do on your show, right? You're always sharing stories and people will love those stories and they will share those stories. I've never seen yet mentor a real human being, a real one share a USP. I've, <laughs> I've never seen that happen. What's your unique selling proposition? How many left brain analytics will ask that question expecting? And what will happen is the business professional will fall into the trap of answering the question that's just nonsense in the first place. So yeah. instead of return on marketing investment, I'm using Rome. Rome as when in Rome, return on marketing effort. How do you know it's working? Forget the money, forget all the metrics. How do you actually know it's working? And I would say it's just what you and I demonstrated. It's those personal uh, anecdotes. It's, uh, well, one of the stories out of the book, which is in chapter two, the story of Canada's huggable car dealer. If, if you recall that story. I certainly How, do. Well, how did he know and how did we know that it's working? Well, within six weeks of those radio ads, when you've got complete strangers coming up to you asking for a hug at the coffee shop or the grocery lineup or the hockey game, you know it's working. In other words, how many personal interactions or when you, you know, in the run of a day, let's talk, let's say you talk to an average of 10 people a day. Well, if the number is zero out of 10, that tells you whatever money and time and effort you're putting into your marketing, it's not working. But if one or two out of 10, and maybe someday three or four out of 10 are saying, hey, geez, mentor, I, I really like that, that episode you did with Jennifer Buchanan, who, who talked about the power of music, like real stuff out of 10, you know? I, your calls to high level people are always getting returned. Uh, you've got more resumes than you can count. Your, your online content is being willingly shared and commented on by people who are not related to you. They're maybe even two or three degrees away from you. That's how you know it's working. When the public, we've got a client out in Calgary, um, when the public is coming forward to 
ask how they can be part of your show and, and, and in turn help advance your brain or your brand, sorry, or when government officials, imagine I've got a manufacturer in Northern New Brunswick, people from the government repeatedly, not just one time, have called him up to ask him, can we be on your show? Bob Lennon at Thermalwood Canada. Yeah. Rome, return on marketing effort, which is more personal and I think, Minter, a lot more tangible to tell you is what we're doing actually working in terms of creating some sort of emotional connection because, as you know, um, nothing triggers business results and sales results like emotion. People mm -hmm. buy an emotion. They justify with logic afterwards. And so because brand, I discovered many years ago, the real power was, was if you could really craft and capture the story that has no ending, then that could be embedded in the mind of the market. And now you can build the story literally for decades. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I, I'm inclined to say that if you create a great story and an infinite number of people listen to it, you actually have an infinite number of recreations because they are associating themselves. They're replacing the hero with themselves or, right. or you know, one of the other protagonists. Well, so um, when you are, one of the things I loved about your book, Gare, as opposed to so many of these books that talk about branding, where we tend to talk about the apples and the, and the, all the other big brands where there's really just a few to pick. What, what, why people need to read your book is because you bring to life so many less well-known examples and you make it uh, patently aware of how they did it and the return, I like to call it the ROE, the return on emotion that they ended up doing. So if someone is listening to this is, is running a medium, small or medium sized business, or even a large one for that matter, hmm. how does one go about carving out this type of mindset? And, and what's, what are the first things that need to happen as an executive or, you know, like you're an intentionally hardworking person in an organization, what do they need to do to sort of move towards these type of activities? I mean, if you're not the CEO, uh, mm. is it possible to, to make it happen? No, it starts from the CEO. I've never seen it start any other way successfully. That's all I can speak to, Mentor. I can only share with what I've seen work. And, it, and I talk about this in the book. Great brands are built by leaders. This is a leadership issue. It's not a marketing issue. And, and so it starts with the mindset of the leader, the CEO, saying, this is actually in my bailiwick. It's no accident that Apple, uh, it's Steve Jobs, who is still the driving force in terms of his legacy. Let's yeah. face it. He built it from the ground up in terms of the brand. Wozniak had the product. Yes, I can speak to this with much more authority than I even share in the book, Mentor, because I was at his house. I was at his house. Uh, back in the summer of 2019, during a speaking visit with, in Silicon Valley, and I spoke with employee number four for about an hour. I mean, it's just, and now they're what? The world's first company to hit the $3 trillion mark. But the principles are the same. So to answer your question succinctly, it begins with your story, not your product or service. Let's drill deeper into this. Who are you beyond your products and services. So everyone after a while in the race to be better, everyone after a while has the same product service features, advantages, benefits. Everyone makes good cars. Everyone's got low insurance rates. You see where I'm going? Fill in the blank, Minter, <laughs> right? Every Hair care products. Right. Every, you're right. Everyone's got the same emulsifiers and cleaning agents and except like everyone. And that's, there's, so, my point is, great brands aren't built on being better. It's being different, creating an identity, an aura, a persona that is completely different 
than everybody else. So the huggable car dealer is the classic small business example. It's the real true life origin of this book. Where did it all, where did the, the, this concept, this theory come from? Well, it came from a market tested situation. And when I met Jim and Donna Gilbert mentor, they got five employees. They're, they're the little people on the corner lot. Do you think for a second in 2002, they would have imagined owning a 17 acre place? You know, when, when I met them, they, they're doing what, 1.2, 1.3 million a year in annual revenue. And it only took us four years before we changed the story. And what people ask me all the time is, well, where's my story? Your story is within you. It's within your vision, values, your character, the shared DNA with your leadership team. It's always there, okay? But in the case of Jim and Donna, and I'm going to try and communicate this as best I can, like they are the kindest, gentlest, most soft-spoken people you can imagine. In fact, there's a, a, are you familiar at all with Seinfeld? The, the, well, the hit. of course, of course, right? Like, well, when I spoke to an audience in Taiwan, they didn't know Seinfeld, so I never know who's right, who's listening. Jerry. <laughs> Jerry. My point is this: is their characters right out of Seinfeld? They are low talkers. They don't fit the stereotype of their industry called used cars. They never did. You know, when I met Jim and Donna, they were. They were doing handmade, handwritten birthday notes for their customers. They were trying to do great business in an honorable, ethical way, Minter. But what happened? They were painted with the same category language brush as everybody else. I, I never forgot, speaking in the United Kingdom, how um, Brits would characterize the used car industry as being very dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very it's, very dodgy. And so when we came out and changed the story in September of 06, and he became Canada's huggable car dealer, the Casanova of customer focus, the Romeo of roadsters and the McDreamy of drive, all that. And then everything that else came afterwards with the hundreds of teddy bears and the mascots and the merry-go-round. It's like visually for the auditory listener here. It's like, uh, this is like, if Walt Disney created a used car lot, this is what it looks like in Frederick and New Brunswick. But it starts from this place called that was their emotional truth. They were already those nice, kind people that you'd love to have as a neighbor. So huggable was the way to capture the poetic truth of who they already were. So I, I'm, I'm hoping to land the plane like one of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, spitfires returning home <laughs> on a mission during the Battle of Britain, man, you've got to find out who you are in terms of your identity beyond whatever products and services you sell. Love it. Um, so, yeah, um, first of all, if I'm a middle manager to go back to that question in an organization, I want this to happen. What I need to do is buy the book for the CEO. Yes. That's the takeaway. Second of all, uh, here's where I wanted to push back at just a section was that not all CEOs are founders. Right. And, and they, 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 they hired in from general electric to run this, uh, this uh, car company. Sure. Or, or whatever. And, and they're oftentimes not programmed for emotion. They're brought in for a job. You've got to turn this company around, Mr. Waxwell. This is what right. we need. We need 10% growth, this and that. Yeah. And, and this idea of, of going back into the emotion and creating and being the figurehead who's hugging everybody is not what that person did at GE. That person was more or less, probably not even, but would have another tattoo and mm -hmm. now needs to transfigure and, and buy into this other thing. So right. at, at one hand, if you have a mercenary, what I call a mercenary CEO, someone who's just come in mm -hmm. as given this assignment, as opposed to a founder CEO who lives it and breathes it used to for the last 20 years, 
like like your um your car used car salespeople it's easier but if you're just if you're coming in as a mercenary ceo what are the things that you would encourage what do you do when you don't bother i would say don't bother don't do this keep doing what you're doing no i because you're either serious about this or you're not see i'm the son of a former pro golfer my dad was born seven minutes mentor from the first tee at St. Andrews, Scotland. Nice. I'm nowhere near what my dad is as a golfer. I'm lucky to break a hundred. I don't know if you're a golf enthusiast or not, no. but I, I learned some very practical, straightforward lessons from the game of golf. And here it is. Here's number. This is speaks to your question. The ball is either in the hole or it's not. You can't do this half-heartedly. This is not like buying the latest, whatever the flavor of the month, shiny penny is. This is a commitment that's going to span for generations. How long has Nike told a story for with three words? What's the Nike story in three words? I, I think I know it. It's about doing something. It, just do something. it. Right? Oh, that's just the do it. Yeah, I was yeah, just yeah. kidding with you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but you know what I mean, Minter, right? Like, of course. They've told that story since 1988. And in chapter seven in the book, um, we go back and explore where the values of that originated dating back to March 1945 of World War II, for crying out loud. We can make that case. And again, I've been to Oregon on uh, a number of occasions, and I've got all the backstories that don't fit into the book. But I look at it as a at the highest level. If I say, what's the first phrase that comes to mind when I say Nike? And we just did this all week, Mentor. We'll do it again next week with a business audience in Vancouver. If I say, on the count of three, come up with the first phrase you think of when you think of Nike, what do you think everyone responds with? Just do it. Do the same thing, mentor. What's the first phrase you think of when you hear Reebok? Blank. Done. So Reebok is my classic symbol of spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on marketing every year. And I can't find an audience anywhere. Okay, whether it's on this continent, your continent, in a, I can't find that audience that knows, well, what do they represent beyond the product, beyond the shoes? And Minter, are we here to debate whether or not they make good shoes? Yes, they make great shoes. I have some. But we're not talking about the product today. We're not talking about operational excellence. We're talking about those hard to measure things like perception, reputation, the, the, the mystique. Why do they, why are they spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a Ferrari? Why are they spending hundreds of dollars on Lululemon sweatpants? You might be able to get the same sweatpants mentor for all I know for 20 or 30 bucks, but the places are crowded with people spending, um, you know, I've got a family member who works in one of those Lululemon stores and can't believe the sales volume that gets pumped through there every single day. Because whether it's Lululemon, whether it's Ferrari, whether it's Nike, your mercenary CEO that you described, and I love how you describe that. I really, really do. They've got to take into account how is this brand going to outlive my involvement? Because if you're looking for the short-term answer, this is not it. And it never but, will be. Yeah. I mean, this is like the, that short-term risk that we have. Right. I mean, the, the short-term attitude. And I, I was chatting on another podcast about how politicians are guided by the re-election, right. which means that they have to be short-term thinking. And so often, especially publicly traded companies, are forced into this because we still don't have an enlightened shareholder. So to the extent that you are privately owned, you have a little bit more flexibility. Yes. Right. In your in your approach. One of the questions I, I was thinking about, to what extent does does it have to be personal? Well, I think and let you tell me if we're going off the rails here. Okay. No, but I, go, think, I mean, I'll go down with you. Please, please. Let's 
because here's where we get into, um, I, I look at it, and I'm going to get into stuff we don't cover in the book, but it, it'll help, I think, everyone listening to us today or watching us understand it all depends on where you point the camera. And here's what I mean. One of the places people go to very quickly is they think it's all got to be about the personal story of the CEO or the founder or whatever, whatever. Okay. And that's not really it. Every story must have a hero. Who's the hero? What does he or she want? What's in the way? If you articulate it deep, deep down. So Jobs would have been the face of Apple, just like Sir Richard Branson over in your country is the face of Virgin. Jim Gilbert, Canada's huggable car dealer, the face, just like Colonel Sanders with Kentucky Fried Chicken, who passed away, you know, decades ago, but is still the face, right? So can you have a brand strategy built on CEO as face? And the answer is yes. But could you also build it around culture? Could culture be the hero? And the answer is yes. Zappos did a great job of that out in Las Vegas and, you know, as a, as a, as a global online retailer. Uh, could you have a character slash celebrity be the face? Well, whether it's Tony the Tiger, the Jolly Green Giant, or David Beckham. Yeah, if you get enough money, you can pony that up couldn't you mentor absolutely yeah or you could make customer the hero or you could make community the hero those are the five things that i've noticed strategically but in all cases there's it there's got to be something of an origin story something that connects to the human spirit if it can't connect to the human spirit through the form of a story it's not going to work. So Nike's, a, I, I'm using the Nike example because it's common, but Nike was really about the customer. There's two words that would have changed it, or sorry, one word with two letters. Imagine, Minter, if they had put the word we just before the just do it. Mm -hmm. Would it have the same impact? No. Not at all. You, you would have killed you kill the magic. And I, I think there is, you know, we say it right in the book. It's one of the key titles. Without magic, it's just marketing. And there's lots of marketing providers providing very similar services to everybody else and similar approaches. And we're saying we're making a very strong argument. No, let's put the magic into it with the oldest stories known to man. So whichever story you choose, Gare, uh, or whichever the five objects you decide to sort of make as the hero, if you will, uh, there's a, uh, a sense, and you, you're very strong about this, of, of really understanding who you are. Right. You, there's the, um, you, you cite Paolo Coelho, who says, the actor discovering who we are will force us to accept that we can go further than we think. Yes. But you also really lean into this idea that you need to be true to who you already are because nobody can actually do that better. Minter, it's, those are the truest words spoken on this podcast so far in, in our little conversation. Here's why. It's called the authentic swing. And I left that uh, until later in the book with the story of my own father who comes from the UK and he too is very quiet, very introverted. I, I'm, I'm the opposite of, of him, right? He's a great golfer and he's introverted. I'm a terrible golfer and a little more outgoing. But that being said, growing up, it's funny, I've never told this story on a podcast yet, but something, the way you asked it sparked it. Growing up, dad was a competitive golfer and a professional in the 1960s when there was no money in the sport, none. He had to scratch and claw for a living to put a roof over the, you know what I mean? Put a roof over our heads and, and feed three kids, right? All right. And then something happened where, um, and I won't get into the drama of it, but dad left the game. And when he left the game, 
he lost everything, Minter, lost his identity, lost who he was as a man. And I think that formed a very deep impression in his one and only son. And I would say without exaggeration, I'm just trying to be respectful. It nearly destroyed him. Okay. In what you can leave it to, I'll just leave it to the imagination. When he came back to the game, he was away from the game mentor for about 10, 12 years, at least a dozen years. Okay. He'd play once during the year and shoot 69. That's how good he was. Wow. Wow. Right. How can a guy be that? But my point is this. I think when I came of age, I became determined that that wasn't going to happen to me. Although I never would have spoken it out loud. I think it had a, I think we all go through that. I think anyone listening can, can identify with that commonality of the human struggle. Our, we see our parents go through things and what happens, mentor? We absorb some of it at probably levels we can't even articulate. We pretend to reject them. And then all of a sudden we pavlovingly come back to them or Whatever all these other different journeys right. we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my point is that I was always determined to do exactly what I wanted to do from from a love of the game point of view. So I became a broadcast journalist. I was a newscaster. I was a sportscaster. Uh, I did 20 years of broadcast journalism. And, and then by a complete accident, fell into this soft skills, business training, consulting, and then whatever it is we call our crazy industry. But what's at the root of it deep, deep down? I'm a history nerd. Deep down, Minter, I love history. I can't watch the documentaries enough. Okay? How much do we want to go through the darkest days of the Blitz in London and in, in World War II and how Churchill, you know, uh, was proven right in the end, right? And, and, and I just, and, and I'm still to this day, you know, where's our Winston Churchill now with his remarkable oratory that's going to get us through the darkest days of the global pandemic, you know, is how we're going to fight on the beaches and in the hills and on the landing grounds. You see where I'm going here? I do. Okay. So naturally, and, right, and I'm hoping this comes through, legends is a natural extension. Big Little Legends is the natural extension of the kid who grow up, grew up when he was eight, nine, ten years old with big, thick, I'm talking mentor, big, thick books, military history, sports history. I just love that stuff and always have. So Stephen Pressfield wrote a great book. I don't know if you're familiar with Pressfield's work or not. It's no. called The War of Art. And I think it might, might be one of the top three books ever written from the point of view of getting really good at this craft we call, right? Mentor, I look at you as a fellow professional. I see you're practicing the craft. And what are we doing? We're always trying to make it better. Pressfield, I think, in The War of Art, wrote kind of like almost the mini Bible for this work we do in terms of communicating bigger ideas through story. His he was a struggling writer for 20 years, lived in a trailer. And then lo and behold, one of his uh, scripts got picked up and it got turned into uh, the legend of Bagger Vance. Nice. Yeah. Robert Redford does the movie. Will Smith and Matt Damon are in the movie. Now the movie tanked, but his novel did okay. Blew and it made it blew up. And, but who was Pressfield? Well, Pressfield, when he was a kid, was a golf caddy. Legend of Bagger Vance is a story of golf. I look at the authentic swing, and with my own family history, I know exactly what he means. So when you ask the question, mentor, the authentic swing, it is remembered. It is not learned, which means it's already inside us. The golf swing is the perfect metaphor in terms of everyone's got their own swing. You go to a golf course, no matter how mechanically they try and the golf pros try and teach it and the instructors, deep down, everyone's swing is different. It's as unique as a thumbprint or a snowflake. 
So the secret with your brand is to get to that place where it was truly authentic to begin with. I love it. So in, in the last few moments that we have together, I want to talk about the another thing which I think is somewhat provocative mm-hmm. uh, and, and goodly so, <laughs> is um, uh, stop relying on data and mm-hmm. have the courage to trust your instincts. That, that seems like a very risky thing to do. Right. Let me throw the risk back at you. I love the question, but let me throw the risk back at you another way. What is the cost of being the same as everybody else? Think about that. No business school is doing the research on that mentor. Not one. Right. And yeah, that's what, that's what we do all the time. We're right. copying best practices. Oh. Right, let's, right? Right. Well, if I go north to St. Andrew, Scotland, from where you are, do you think they're worried about that at all? Oh, I know. Not, n- not, not one least. thimble. No. N- no, they know their story. And as we articulate in chapter 12, we can pinpoint the date of when the whole thing blew up, right? July 9th, 1960, when Arnold Palmer makes that trip across the pond. Like, that's it. I know that story because my dad grew up there, mentor. Guess what? There were no crowds in 1957. No crowds after World War II waiting for, uh, more than a year for a tea time at St. Andrews. It wasn't always famous. So what happens is, you know, right across the business landscape and the marketing landscape, this reliance and, and going straight to data without taking into account the acts of creation and intuition that are going to actually create the story, something worth talking about. It's a lot easier to default to what everybody else is doing. I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about be your own Picasso, come up with something original, come up with something that no one else is even doing in your market. I explain to my CEO groups all the time, you know, if everybody zigs, you zag. That's it. It's, it's real simple, right? And so I think one of the things, I know we're uh, wrapping up here for time, CEOs and leadership teams have got to make, these are tough executive decisions, mentor. You got to decide what you're not going to be. Think about that. Decide what you're not going to be and how you're not going to play in the same mosh pit with the same language and the same tactics as everybody else. Because if it can be easily copy and replic- copied and replicated, what does that tell you right away? And that's why I say these are leadership decisions. And if you're the 60-year-old, 65-year-old CEO of a $50 million company and you, you've, you've abdicated responsibility to the 22-year-old social media intern, you've missed the plot. This is more like General Eisenhower trying to make the decision. What, it, what was Eisenhower weighing just before the D-Day invasion operation overlord? I think that's a great metaphor, mentor, mentor because what, what was going on? The weather had turned nasty in the English Channel in the days leading up to the planned invasion, right? Half of the Supreme Allied Command, the generals and admirals are split. If we go, the heavy, you know, high winds and heavy seas could compromise naval and aerial operations. But if we don't go, that could compromise secrecy. Like, you'll never have all the facts. Never. So I always say inside organizations today, we need Eisenhowers who can make a leadership decision with incomplete information. And quite frankly, since the pandemic, leaders have been forced to make bigger decisions with incomplete information because you'll never because if you rely too much on that that ship's going to sail someone else is going to get to the punch first i can't help that think that that not only will provide more success because you will be different and hopefully better still uh, but actually it'll be more meaningful and and more fulfilling uh in the time that you spend because we spend a ton of time at work 
So why don't we do things that are that are resonating with me as an individual who happens to work as opposed to only at work? Right. And so if you expand on that, when you know who you are beyond your products and services and you know and you can capture that in a story, I typically say you've got two to six words to really capture the story. You know, I couldn't help but thinking, uh, knowing we were going to come on and have this conversation, I, I, I've been dying to get this line out. I wanted you and I to be spinal tap today. I know you're a great ah, dead fan, that's but true. let's turn the, let's turn up the to dial 11. up to, let's turn the dial up to 11, right? There you go. With mentor dial. You see where I'm going? Oh, I love it. Y- yeah. But my point is this, when we know who we are, uh, and can capture that in a story, what we've done in effect is make the competition irrelevant. Now it doesn't matter what they do or don't do. Let them stay in the category mosh pit with everybody else. And I can speak with conviction and confidence on this because the huggable car dealer, the, you know, you start with a story mentor and then it becomes like mythology and then it becomes legend. And Oh, now the guy's the biggest, you know, used car dealer in all four Atlantic Canadian provinces. In 2018, he got into the Kawasaki business with power sports and recreational vehicles. He becomes number one in Canada, supported in a large part by building reputational equity for over a dozen years. 15 years later, what do you see? You see a $50 million company employing 38 people in the worst category in the world, right, with perception and reputation, but totally redefining everything because it started with, in their case, with Jim and Donna, that was their authentic swing, Canada's huggable car dealer. And that's the story now, like Nike's Just Do It, that has no ending. You can tell this forever and and build along the way, as opposed to one-off campaigns. Does that make sense? Beautiful. Of course it does. Yeah. Gare. Pleasure having you on. I loved your energy. How can people track you down, get your book, of course, or follow you uh, and figure out more about what you're up to? Yeah, thank you, Minter. I'm the easiest guy to find on the internet. Uh, Gare, G-A-I-R, Maxwell. Uh, Like, I don't need SEO or you just punch it in, go to the website. I will say this. I, I do want to acknowledge our publisher, Page Two. We had great support. Trina White and team. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's how you and I met, right? Exactly. Through, through through our publisher, Page Two. Uh, my partner in business, life and crime, Dana Zillick, she did a lot of the, the science-based research. Like, Mentor, we went through, she went through, identified like something like 30 different scientific and, and medical studies that made the bridge between storytelling and science. And, and we captured the best of that in the book. So whether it's, uh, uh, you know, and, and all to say, um, we do an ongoing series that starts back up again, January 19th called leaders and legends. So just go to garemaxwell.com book. It's a, it's our leaders and legends. It's like our little Netflix type series. We do a lot on video, about 95% of our posts are all video based, but for example, the story of Steve jobs and his leadership legacy, anyone can go in our archives and find all kinds of things that just might get the uh, the sparks flying and the imagination wheels turning. Lots of great resources, Gare. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci, mon ami. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show or would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service, And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on MinterDial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. a stranger 
tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free. Trust is a reason. Still, I won't tell the lie. I sit here passively, hope for your respect, anticipating the thrill of your intellect. Maybe I tell myself. No use in me lying. I'm a convinced man building an urge. I'm a convinced man to live and die submerged. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man challenge my fate. I'm a convinced man. Competitions innate, I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman. Despite revenges and struggle with deceit, live for the challenge so life's not incomplete. What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die. I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free. Trust in my reason and let me show you why. I'm a convinced man practicing my lines. I'm a convinced man here in these confines. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man. Put me to the test. I'm a convinced man. I'm ready for an arrest. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman.